Moving on to the interactive discussion, I would like to introduce to uh, Mr. Ignacio Socias, Director of International Relations of the International Federation for Family Development, IFFD. Mr. Socias holds a doctorate in law, and since 2010, his role has involved extensive global engagement in coordination with United Nations activities. He has visited 64 cities in 45 countries, participated in 206 international meetings, delivered 198 keynote speeches and conducted 87 high-level meetings with government officials. He has been instrumental in leading global projects as of families and societies in Europe, SDGs and families, and family policies globally with UNICEF, and inclusive cities for sustainable families globally with 234 cities and regions. Mr. Socias, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alex, for your wide presentation. And um, I think we are here really to commemorate a double anniversary because this is the occasion of the 30th anniversary of ICPD and the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, which, as Renata has just told, will be officially celebrated in just a few days. So as we get into those celebrations, I would like to very briefly start by telling you that this, for us, for IFFD, has been the year of Asia. Why? Because of two very important events, among others. The first one has been repeatedly mentioned here, this expert group meeting we had hosted by the government of Malaysia with really very, very good experts from 12 Asian countries who were contributing. I will get into that a, a bit maybe later. But let me start by going to the fundamentals of our work. Right from the very start, we had very, very clear the importance of the International Year of the Family. Looking back and what was a bit low-key celebrations on the 10th anniversary, we really tried to promote it on 2014 for the 20th anniversary, and now 2024 for the 30th. Why? Because of something that every single resolution of the General Assembly about families say, that families need special attention, that it is crucial that they can really perform their role in society. Well, this is what we have tried to repeat once and again inside the UN, inside this building, inside other UN buildings, but also around the world. But let me be very, very clear about this. We, this is not just about being family friendly for appearances sake. We are about real fairness and equality. So that's why I personally don't like very much the term family friendly, because it kind of stresses uh, something more emotional than objective, that fair which is what I think it should be. That's why we have talked about family-oriented, family-responsive, other ways to say it. I insist in my opinion better. And understanding how important families are to society means that it is really a matter of justice. And um, we will have now, next year, the, the second World Social Summit marking another 30th anniversary, 30th anniversary of the Copenhagen Declaration and the first World Social Summit. And I think it's a very good opportunity to show the link between human rights, social justice, and this special attention to families. In other words, 
I think the link between looking out for families and upholding human rights and freedoms is very clear. And we also know that sadly, lots of people are still having their basic rights violated because society doesn't value families as it should. Let's just, just mention Article 16 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When you look at what's going on around the world, it's obvious that the right to start a family, to live as a family, to live family values, to really give important, <coughs> import, the importance everybody should be given, is not a reality everywhere and all the time. That's why at the core of our advocacy work is understanding how the goals of the Copenhagen Declaration and the International Year go hand in hand. They go together, especially when it comes to tackling poverty, creating decent jobs, bringing people together, which are, I think, like the three main principles of the Copenhagen Declaration. And also, as you know, the, the resolutions of the General Assembly have been very, very based on these three ideas as the objectives of the international year. The um, poverty, decent jobs, and intergenerational solidarity have been like the real three points around which the whole preparation for and celebrations of the different anniversaries have gone around. And for 2024, also, the General Assembly outlined these four big mega trends uh, that have been getting a lot of attention over the past four years. Uh, how family life is affected by technology, by city living, by population changes, or by climate change. But I think they are all very well rooted on this Copenhagen Declaration. So, knowing how important it is to deal with these trends head on, especially with everything going on after the pandemic, we've set up online focus groups, for instance, to discuss about each one of these. The aim was to create useful content that not only informs, but also gives families practical advice they can use. And in addition to these efforts, as Renata has already mentioned, we have actively collaborated in convening a series of United Nations expert group meetings, regional expert group meetings, uh, in, in the Arab region, in Latin America, in North America, in Europe, and in Asia. Most of them also co-organized with the Doha Family Institute represented here. But this very last meeting, and I go back to it now for a moment, focus on the interlinkages between migration, urbanization, new technologies, demographic trends, and climate change in Asia has been especially enlightening because it has shown that quite often we forget that Asia is two-thirds of the world population, practically. And, and so the future has probably to count more with that world. And we, I mean, I am from Europe. Some of them are, some of you are also from Europe, from America. I think we have this to make this a special effort to learn from what has been happening and what is happening and what can happen in Asia. Particularly, I wanted to focus in some points which are part of the recommendations of the expert group meeting. First, migration patterns are influenced by factors such as economic opportunities, political instability, environmental pressures. The rapid urbanization in Asia has led to the growth of cities and megacities attracting migrants 
from rural areas and neighboring countries, strengthening urban infrastructure and services, contributing to issues like overcrowding, inadequate housing, environmental degradation. If we were talking before about family values in society, which are human values at the end, maybe we need to think of how the situation of so many men in Asia having to work, to go to work in another country, leaving their families behind, can be solved. Because this means, I won't get into uh, ECD, we will have after, but I mean, how can we allow those children to grow without a father? Second, new technologies play a dual role in migration and urbanization for sure. Uh, uh, on one hand, advancements in transportation and communication have facilitated migration and urbanization by reducing barriers to mobility and enhancing connectivity between rural and urban areas. But on the other hand, technology-driven industries and smart city initiatives have transformed urban landscape, creating new employment opportunities, improving urban living standards, while also exacerbating disparities and displacing marginalized communities. So there is also a lot to be thought, to be learned, to be proposed, a lot of recommendations we can make on this. I'm trying to show you that we have a lot of work ahead in the following years. And these are just some ideas, but I, I, I would like to mention them. Three, demographic trends including population growth, aging populations, and changing family structures, really are influencing migration and urbanization patterns. High population density in urban areas puts pressure on resources and infrastructure, while aging populations pose challenges for healthcare systems and social welfare policies. Four, climate change at adds another layer of complexity to migration, urbanization, and demographic trends. Rising temperatures, extreme weather events, sea level rise, etc., etc., etc. Urbanization exacerbates climate change through increased carbon emissions and environmental degradation, with demographic shifts that affect vulnerability and resilience to climate-related risks. So when talking about interlinkages between those four mega trends, I think we have still we have just started to see what we should do in the following years. It is true that there were some very good final recommendations, uh, like help families stick together by having better child care. Uh, make sure everyone can use technology to make his families happier. Uh, plan making cities smarter and greener. Make it easier for families to stay together and help each other, no matter where they come from. And teach families how to be ready for bad things that might happen in the future, like floods, fires, by sharing information and getting ready for them. We speak a lot about unwanted loneliness and that is a reality for older people and also for kids sometimes. But what about unwanted lack of information? This is something I think we need also to, to think about. Well, this extra group meeting uh, in Asia is just an example of the 28 events we have organized or co-organized at IFFD to prepare this anniversary. And the other event I wanted to mention is our World Congress that took place in Cebu, Philippines, with more than 1,300 delegates, underscoring the global resonance of our initiatives. We had people there from 51 countries. So it was very good to see what concerns families have in common, families from the five continents. And conversations during the Congress highlighted a notable gap in understanding 
regarding the nexus between family dynamics and climate change. This underscores the significance of our institutional position and the importance of educational initiatives to bridge this knowledge deficit. So drawing from all these experiences, I wanted to emphasize the paramount importance of prioritizing quality over quantity in our work. Uh, I know that I've just here <laughs> like to say a lot of things in a short time, but I hope that they inspire you and they inspire me and they inspire us to work better. And finally, you know, this is not all. Since 2019, we have been working with non-governmental organizations to create a new civil society declaration that is already finished and has been joined by quite a few organizations from all over the world. And um, we have had the help there of Generations United from the US, the Hungarian Last Families Association, the Doha International Family Institute again, the European Parents uh, Association, um, Haro from Sweden, uh, etc. Our main goal really with this declaration was to make sure lawmakers, opinion makers, understand what families need, especially with the big challenges they are facing throughout the world. And this declaration has 11 very clear recommendations. I encourage you to read carefully and also to be the inspiration for your work in the, in the following months and the following years. To sum up, these 11 points show the important things our societies need right now. They highlight how we urgently need to work together to solve these problems. Uh, I, sometimes I feel that in daily life there are like three different levels. The, levels, the level of politicians or lawmakers, the level of journalists or public opinion makers, and then the level of normal people who have to deal day to day with their own difficulties, their own problems, and who are the one who really justify the existence of everyone else and who need to be listened. So that's, that's my great hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio, and thank you for all the uh, revision of all, all the civil society declaration that we're definitely um, getting ready to present it on the 15th.